and have given you all of my heart. But there's someone who has torn it apart, and she's taken just all that I have. If you wanna try to love again, well, baby, I'll try to love again, but I know. skin tears, um, identify and measure to prevent skin damage. We're going to look at the difference between incontinence associated dermatitis, which you may hear referred to as IAD, candiditis, I never can say this word, intertrigo, intertrigo, intertrigo. Uh, stage one pressure ulcers and a suspected deep tissue injury. I know that we've gone over those before but it's something that's important that we want you to remember. When you're doing your assessment, we want accurate descriptions of the lesions. That's an essential thing. We talked about it last time. You want to look um, at the distribution shape and arrangement of any lesions, the borders, the margins, any associated changes within the lesions, different pigmentation, and Clues to the cause of the lesions are derived from the individual history and physical assessment. So when we talk about distribution, is it localized? Is it, um, does it appear in one small area? You know, is it on the right kneecap? Regional, it involves a specific region of the body, like the trunk, the abdomen, the uh, the arm, whatever. And generalized is it when the lesions are um, widely uh, distributed over numerous areas of the body at the same time. We're going to look at the shape and the arrangement. Is it round? Is it discoid? Is it oval? Is it annular? Which means like the rings of a tree trunk. Is, is it zostriform or dermatonal? Does it follow the lines of the dermatones? Is it polycyclic? Is it linear? Is it a target lesion? Is it stellate or star-shaped? Is it serapigmous? I know I'm not saying that exactly right, but it's snake-like. You know, wavy snake like. Is it reticulate? Is it mobile form? In primary skin lesions, macules, papules, patches, plaques, wheel, and nodules. Um, can anybody tell me the difference between a macule and a papule? The macula is, is flat and the papula is elevated. There's tumors, there's vesicles, which is fluid filled, bulla, pustules, cysts. 
Talon? Yeah. Which is spider, the little red spider veins. So the secondary lesions you might hear are scale, and we all know what dry scaly skin is, where flakes are like dandruff is scale. Lichification, keloids, which is the scarring, the excessive growth, and then hypertrophic scars, which are similar to keloids. Excoriation. Somebody define excoriation for me. Dr. Brooks is telling us. It's linear scratches. How many of us have looked at a perineum that's red and inflamed and said it's excoriated? That's not the right term unless there's scratch marks. And I'm going to tell you quite frankly, I didn't know that until I went to the Wound Academy because I've always used excoriation, and most everybody here has, to describe that. So, what is the correct term for the redness and what we used to call it excoriation? Well, it depends. It can be associate, uh, incontinence associated dermatitis, it can just be a localized dermatitis, it can be candiditis, it can be fungal. It just doesn't look very that's a good description. Of course, they don't, uh, they don't let us describe it like that in the, the chart, but yes. Um, that's like when I was an ICU nurse, they would say, well, what's that? And I said, that's an FLB. And they said, well, what's that? It's a funny looking bee. <laughs> Fissures, erosion, ulcers, crust, and atrophy. Where are we going to see a lot of crusting? On a weeping wound. And what, where do we see weeping wounds? What are those associated with? Venus. Venus stasis ulcer. Yeah. So skin damage is caused either by mechanical means, moisture, and we talked about moisture before that you know, it decreases the skin's, it, it increases the risk of damage to the skin when it's moist. Chemical, different chemicals can burn the skin. Um, vascular and neuro, neuropathic. So vascular is, is, there's impaired circulation to the extremities. Neuropathic has to do with like uh, diabetic neuropathies. Uh, infectious agents including bacterial, viral, and allergic reactions, as well as, and then radiation. The mechanical means pressure and intensity, duration, and the, uh, we talked to, Diane talked a little bit about tissue tolerance. Once you have a healed wound and then it reopens, the tissue tolerance is decreased. Shear is the sliding movement of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue while the underlying muscle and bone remain stationary. And then friction is the resistance to motion in a parallel direction relative to the common boundary between the two surfaces. An Indian burn. When you're a kid, yeah, somebody gave you an Indian burn. And skin stripping, that skin tears, that's it. Uh, accidental removal of the epidermis with or without the dermis. Uh, don't know why that B is there, uh, by mechanical means. When we talk about skin tears, and, and those happen quite frequently in our elderly population, especially our elderly population that happen to have been on long-term steroid use, our COPDers, our diabetics that have uh, impaired skin to begin with. Um, you can classify them, uh, this is one of the scales, it's the Payne Martin scale. The, the um, category one classification, it can be A or B. Um, the one A is a skin tear where you can fully approximate the wound, which means you can smooth down the, the flap where it seals, um, but then you can also have a linear flap type tear where you can't approximate it, and that's called a 1B. Uh, this 
the class two is a skin tear with a partial thickness loss uh, where you're going to lose, it, it goes into uh, the epidermis um, and the dermis. And then the skin tear with complete tissue loss. You take the whole flap of skin off and that, that happens readily. Wouldn't that be more like you know, like motor vehicle accident or a motorcycle accident? It could be. I have seen little people just brush up against the wall and have a, a, a skin, stage three skin tear. And the first thing you want to do is cleanse them. And the second thing you want to do is try to reapproximate that flap. And uh, I can tell you one of the best teachers on that happens to be sitting right here, Juanita. Uh, is one of the best ones at fixing skin tears. And then you want to cover it and secure it. And most of the time around here we use a tegadone a little bit. So moisture, when skin is exposed to it for extended periods of time, it loses the, the, the normal barrier function of the skin. <coughs> and it increases the pH of the skin. It makes it... Uh, more alkaline and it increases the risk of bacterial colonization. Uh, bacteria like warm moist areas and it predisposes the individual to any kind of cutaneous infection. You can have an irritant that causes a contact dermatitis. Um, can, it can be urine, but other things. Um, huh? Feces. Um, if you've ever had a, a peg tube that leaked in gastric contents, uh, it causes a, a dermatitis, a diaper dermatitis. That's why we try not to use, uh, especially on our bed bound patients, any kind of diapers. Uh, we try to use the, the, the absorb pads um, and then the perineal dermatitis. Incontinence associated dermatitis is our biggest problem. Uh, when a, a patient, um, our biggest problem is, is patients that don't want us to check them. They're up, they're in a wheelchair. They describe themselves as occasionally incontinent. They do have a TENS on. Well, they don't feel uncomfortable because that a TENS or the brief tends to wick away moisture. They don't necessarily, because their, their sensory perception is off, they don't necessarily feel that moisture. That's why it's so important to, to encourage these patients to let us check them and change them if they're up in a wheelchair and they have uh, any kind of incontinence briefs on them. And then just moisture associated skin damage, like I was talking about before. Patients that are, they sweat a lot, or that tend to overstay, they're welcome in the shower and they get the pruny fingers and everything. Because we have some that will take, if they won't take showers, they'll stay in there for a long time. So I want to make sure we know the difference between incontinence associated dermatitis and a pressure ulcer. The pressure ulcer usually is over bony prominence or under a medical device. Uh, it can be full thickness. It may be uh, a deep tissue injury. You may have undermining and, and tunneling, and it's caused from pressure or shear. Incontinence associated dermatitis is in the perineal and perianal areas, the inner thighs. It's superficial. It's partial thickness. You see maceration of the surrounding skin, and then it's from stool and, um, and urine. And then the inter I'm going to stumble off of that word every time. The endotricus uh, dermatitis you see on the buttocks in the intergluteal cleft, um, the base of the panis. Does everybody know what the panis is? Okay, and underneath the breast and in the groin fold. It's superficial and partial. You do see maceration of the surrounding skin and it's from perspiration and it could have friction or not. 
um, the goal is to get those areas dry. And this is incontinence associated dermatitis. And you can see where it's in the on the buttocks, in the perianal, in the, the perineal area. Chemical, betadine, can cause skin problems. It's a drying agent. Alkaline soaps also, they remove the natural, normal, barrier protectiveness of the skin. Alcohol, another drying agent. Gastrointestinal contents, we talked about that, especially patients with PEG tubes or you may have patients uh, that may have uh, glossomies and they may have um, fistulas that drain. And so, or any drainage from percutaneous tubes, we get, we have gotten patients that have uh, perk drains in their bile duct, and so uh, that's real caustic to the skin. Fecal incontinence, especially, what's the worst one with fecal incontinence that you can think of? I bet Patty can tell us because she was in facial control. Oh, that's difficile C. difficile C. difficile diarrhea. It will really burn the skin. Vascular damage is caused by uh, either venous insufficiency, or arterial insufficiency, neuropathy, or combination of one or all, uh, one, two, or all three. Uh, it's on the legs and the feet. Uh, it's sometimes can be precipitated by benign trauma. How many of you have had um, a diabetic patient come in and never even know they have a wound on their foot? And then you take the, the shoe off and you find it. Yeah. And each one of these have distinct and distinguishing uh, features, pathological process, and treatment regimens. Can somebody tell me, by, could you tell by looking the difference between a venous stasis ulcer and an arterial ulcer? Anybody know the difference? Usually, the venous ulcers, venous insufficiency, they'll have the hemosiderin staining, crusty, weepy lesions. Um, the arterial insufficiency, they're round, punched out lesions. And they're not, they don't have the crust around them. This is an arterial ulcer, an example of an arterial ulcer. Back. See how it's round and circumscribed there, and then the venous ulcer. You can get the the hemosiderin staining, the weeping from the the actual ulcers right here, and then the dry crust. But don't you have to have studies to determine for sure what causes it? Because you could damage the patient if you put the wrong dressing on an arterial versus a venous. That's true. I don't want anyone to think here that they're going to be able to look at it and then stop and put on it that the patient loses his leg. No, 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 no. You're, you're very correct. And the way we, uh, Diane's going to cover that more, I think, is it tomorrow? This afternoon. This afternoon. Um, but those are just examples. No. And then the infectious agent. There's fungal infections. We've all seen these. Those occur in the, the skin folds. Um, the derm dermatophytes and tinea, athlete's foot and the fungal nails, we've seen those. Bacteria, cellulitis, folliculitis, impetigo, and I can't say that last one, I'm sorry. Say it, Diane, please. Erythrasma. Erythrasma, okay. Now these are examples uh, the candiditis, the interigo, and the impetigo. We don't see a whole lot of impetigo around here, uh, but we do see the, uh, the other two quite frequently, especially in our obese patients.
Okay, under our infectious agent spiral, the herpes simplex virus, and the varicell zoster. <coughs> This is the herpes simplex. You see the cold sores. This next one, I'll have to tell you all the history on this. My son was 26. He's in the Air Force. He called me. He said, Mom, I've got this pain in my back, and it's going down my leg. He went to the doctor. The doctor said it was sciatica. Two days later, he sends me the pictures. He said, Mom, I don't think this is sciatica. What is it? He had shingles. And I did have his permission to flash his picture. <laughs> <laughs> Allergic factors, it may be local or systemic. A true allergic dermatitis, it requires an exposure to the allergen. Finding out what the allergen is can be very difficult. The first phase, the sensitization phase, transpires over the first week to 10 days. And then the next, it, it's an elicitation phase. It occurs within 48 to 72 hours once the individual is re-exposed to the allergen. So they may not exactly have the reaction initially, but they can develop, once they're exposed to the allergen, and then they're re-exposed to it, they can have a reaction. Okay, this is um, an allergy skin test. I don't know if anybody's ever had any of those, but um, they're not a lot of fun, but they show you what you're allergic to. They put all these little needles in the back, and it shows that these are, these are positive reactions. And this is a drug reaction rash. We recently have had two patients that had drug reaction rashes. Uh, one, his skin began to slough off. It was a whole systemic reaction. I mean, it started out just on his trunk, but it moved up to his face. Even when the medication that they thought was causing the drug reaction was removed. So if you see just even an initial breakout, you need to, to alert the provider and you really need to watch because it can extend and it can extend extremely bad when it's a drug reaction. And then radiation. Radiation is used to um, treat cancers. Um, it is a complication of the radiation therapy. The radiation therapy generates free radicals and that damages the cellular components and it's almost, well it is a burn light. Um, this gentleman was being treated for throat cancer and had a, a radiation burn. We know that skin can damage can occur from multiple things. It can be a combination sometimes too of mechanical moisture, chemical, uh, vascular, neuropathic, infectious, bacterial, viral, allergic or radiation. It's very important to do a history and a physical assessment because you need to determine the cause of the skin damage. And that's how you can formulate a treatment plan is when you know what's causing the damage. And the management, treatment, and the prevention is a, it's ongoing, and I can't emphasize this enough. It's a team approach. It's not just one person responsible. It's everybody that's responsible. Does anybody have any questions? I probably finished too early. Should we have a question on the push? Oh, yeah. She, she, on this? Yeah, she brought that out. And, uh, like, are you familiar with its use or who uses it? Or, it uh, is recommended by the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. It is, and I think we do use it here in, maybe not in that exact form, um, 
Sylvia Esquivel is the one that, that monthly we report the different pressure ulcers to, and she she uh, we do a weekly. Where is this pressure ulcer at? The measurements, uh, what the treatment is it improving or is it not improving? So we may not use that exact form, but we we do use uh, something very similar. And then that is reported, I think, even up to the national. Absolutely. On the, the push tool, too, just a couple of quick comments. It is, um, it's non-proprietary, so it can be downloaded and used uh, without any type of copyright restrictions. Um, it's used, ideally, it's, it's intended for pressure ulcer use. And the nice thing about it is that it's a scale that goes from 0 to 17. And as the number decreases, the wound is healing. And it's a very nice way to truly quantify wound healing. We actually had tried to get that in the CLC in San Antonio, and we were met with some resistance, but that may change. But anyway, it's a very useful tool. Um, there's objective. It's very objective, and there's some evidence that suggests it might be helpful with documenting progress for other types of chronic wounds, such as venous ulcers and um, uh, you know arterial ulcers. So um, it is very nice, and I think it's something to sort of keep in your tool bag, so to speak. But it is a nice measurement tool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for getting a copy. Nice. I forgot to have her uh, print those out before. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, we are going to have lunch. We'll resume uh, in an hour, so uh, 1300 hours, so at 1 o'clock. We'll be right here, right back, we're ready to start.
Baby, I know 